All right, welcome everyone. We are gonna go ahead and get started. First, I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us today for this webinar. We're gonna learn more about how widespread chemical, chemical pesticide use has contributed to environmental injustices that we see today and how it impacts the health of people, pollinators in our environment. And today we are so lucky to have a panel of three speakers who will be sharing their knowledge and work towards environmental justice and food justice. I'm Danielle Yanicello OMB with People and Pollinators Action Network. Um, if you've been attending some of our webinars in the past, you're probably used to seeing Joyce up here leading the webinars. But this semester, I'm completing my internship with People and Pollinators, so I have organized today's webinar for you all. I am a second year graduate student at the Colorado School of Public Health and I'm working towards a master's degree in public health in health systems management and policy. I've always been really interested in environmental health issues and through my program I've become more drawn and interested in environmental health policy. So I'm really excited to be organizing this webinar for you all. Um, just a few words about People and Pollinators Action Network, PPAN for short. We are an advocacy organization working to protect the health of pollinators and people by promoting healthy pollinator habitats, sustainable agricultural practices, and biodiversity in our environment across Colorado. PPAN is focused on policy work at the state and local level and focused on building relationships across Colorado to foster community awareness and to promote community engagement on these issues. Um, while PPAN has a strong focus on protecting pollinator health and habitats, we recognize that the health of pollinators in the environment um, are closely tied to the health of humans. So for this webinar, we really wanted to focus on the impact that pesticides have on human health. And we also recognize that this issue does not impact everyone equally, and it disproportionately impacts certain groups of people and communities, including farm workers, people living in rural areas and farming communities, people of color and children. And these groups of people um, face greater risks to being exposed to these chemical pesticides in their environment, through the air, through the water, and through the soil. Um, and therefore, they face greater risks to their health. So our speakers will be talking about this issue from an equity lens, and we will learn more about what communities are experiencing these injustices in Colorado and also across the US, and really how we can mobilize to protect these groups of people through our government agencies, through our local organizations, and policy work at different levels. Our speakers will also be talking about regenerative and organic farming practices that protect our environment from being polluted by chemical pesticides and how these methods really promote human health and also help to build sustainable food systems in our communities. We will also be learning about the issue of food justice. Not everyone has access to pesticide-free organic produce, especially people living in food deserts, as well as people who do not have the financial means to access these foods. So we'll learn more about the work being done to increase the access to organic foods. So I'm just going to introduce our speakers and tell you a little bit more about them. Our first speaker will be Dr. Jill Harrison. She is the Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And her research has focused on environmental sociology, sociology of agriculture and food systems, as well as environmental justice in the United States. And Jill recently wrote a new book, from the Inside Out, the Fight for Environmental Justice Within Government Agencies. Our next speaker will be AJ Carrillo, and he is on the board of Valley Organic Growers Association. He is also a local farmer in Hotchkiss, Colorado. He and his wife own and operate Deer Tree Farm in Agroforest, where they take a regenerative approach to farming to produce diversified and organic produce. And our last speaker will be Jason Ogiste, and he is one of the founding members and farm directors at Frontline Farming. 
Jasan is experienced in implementing regenerative land practices in using biointensive models in his growing techniques. Um, in addition to the work that he does at Frontline Farming, Jasan is also an artist and passionate about policy work, and he serves as the Black Indigenous Person of Color representative on the National Policy Committee for the National Young Farmers Association. So we are so lucky to have these speakers sharing their knowledge and unique perspectives with us today. I really hope that you enjoy learning from their presentations. Um, during the presentations, please keep your microphones muted. And if you have any questions at all during the presentations, feel free to shoot your questions into the chat box um, and we will get to answering those after the presentations. I'm going to now hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Jill Harrison. Great, thank you. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you <clears throat> um, to you and to Joyce for the invitation to come talk with you all this afternoon. <clears throat> so my name is Jill Harrison. I'm an associate professor of sociology at CU Boulder. Um, and so one of the big parts of my job is doing research. For the past 20 years or so, I've been con conducting research on environmental hazards that harm human health, excuse me. <clears throat> and in particular, my work focuses on the ways that these hazards often disproportionately burden the most vulnerable communities in our country and elsewhere around the world, and in particular communities of color, indigenous communities, and working class communities, and immigrant communities. This pattern is what we call environmental inequality or environmental injustice. This is the focus of environmental justice movements within our country and elsewhere who have been bringing attention to these inequalities for decades, if not centuries, although the term environmental justice is something that's really just been used in the past few decades. Hundreds of studies demonstrate that these environmental inequalities exist, that they are serious, and that they contribute to vast inequalities in illness and death along lines of race, class, indigenous status, and other forms of social status. So I've been studying these environmental inequalities and in particular the factors that undermine the effectiveness of environmental regulations to help redress these inequalities. And most recently, I've been studying ways that government agencies can more effectively regulate environmental hazards in general, and in particular to reduce environmental inequalities. The need for this, the importance of this has never been more clear, I would argue. COVID-19 is disproportionately killing Native Americans and people of color in this country, and this is being well documented. This stems from many different factors, including racially unequal patterns of air pollution, including exposure to toxic um, chemical pesticides, all of which systematically compromise people's immune systems and exacerbate respiratory conditions. Some of my work on environmental justice has been done through my research on pesticide drift and political conflict over how well agricultural pesticide drift is regulated. Um, so I, in my work, I, oper I define pesticide drift as the airborne movement of agricultural pesticides away from where they're applied and into some other social space. Pesticide, pesticides drift into schoolyards, into residential areas, into other farms, um, into roadways, into all kinds of pe places where people then get exposed to them. And the focus of my work has been on the most drift prone and most toxic pesticides, and in particular on soil fumigants, although certainly within my research, I included all kinds of other pesticides as well. Um, the data that I collected for this research included in-depth confidential interviews with regulatory agency staff at federal, state, and local levels as well as in-depth interviews with community activists, so people who had decided to become politically active um, in order to address pesticides that they felt were harming themselves and or other people in their communities. I also conducted extensive observation of agency events as well as activist events. So my work really focused on this conflict between community activists and regulatory officials about how well agricultural pesticide drift was regulated. And my work has focused on California in particular, 
um, for a bunch of different reasons, including the fact that the state of California collects better data than any other state in the nation around pesticide use and pesticide illnesses. But also the state of California, in, I think in many ways serves as an important case for the rest of us to look at and to understand given its extremely high pesticide use rates, but also its massive pesticide regulatory apparatus and its vibrant alternative agriculture movement, this should, California should be a place where they're able to get a handle on pesticide drift better than anywhere else in many ways, and yet they're not. Pesticide drift incidents and illnesses continue to persist. So my question was why? That's the, you know, why is that the case? Why is pesticide why do pesticide drift incidents and illnesses still continue? How big of a problem is it? What should be done about it? Um, and I published the results of this in a book that I, my first book, which was published by MIT Press. And when I'm done with my comments, I'll drop a link to that in the chat in case anyone is interested. <clears throat> um, so I, I wanted to share with you three lessons that I learned from that work and as it stems into my more recent research. First of all, first key lesson I learned is that official data from regulatory agencies on the health impacts of pesticides are very important, but they represent only the tip of the iceberg. The, and our regulations need to count for the rest of that iceberg, the entire iceberg of the kind of the scope of pesticide drift. So here's what I mean by that. Pesticide, if you talk to agency staff at pesticide regulatory agencies, what they'll tell you is that pesticide drift is a series of rare and isolated accidents that are caused by people who break the rules. That it's something that stems from bad actors or people just otherwise making mistakes. And I showed through my research that there's a different and more accurate way to understand the scope and impacts of pesticide drift. And in particular, through evaluating a wide array of existing data and triangulating across those, including conducting interviews with community activists and other pesticide activists, what I found was that pesticide drift is much better understood as an everyday phenomenon. And this is something that affects human health, of course, but also wildlife, including pollinators. Pesticide drift is an everyday thing. It's both terrifying and normal at the same time for folks living in agricultural communities that are pesticide intensive. What I also showed is that we also need to understand it as disproportionately harming our most vulnerable community members, including immigrant farm workers and their families. And there's a lot more that I could say about it, so I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A. Um, there are some things that we definitely know from science. One is that we know that many extremely toxic and drift prone pesticides are widely used in US agriculture. We also know that they can drift even when they're used according to regulation and according to the strictest regu regulations. We also know from epidemiological research that there are clear patterns of illnesses consistent with pesticide exposure in agricultural communities. However, there's no smoking gun connecting all of these pieces. We cannot definitively specify agricultural pesticides contributions to these illnesses. And there's lots of reasons for that, including, um, for example, pesticide risk assessment doesn't yet account for the actual combinations of hazards that people are exposed to, much less the other forms of stress that certain communities disproportionately experience that exacerbate the effects of exposure. Um, there's all kinds of other factors, including the fact that air monitoring for pesticides is rarely conducted, even in states like California that have these massive pesticide regulatory apparatuses. And additionally, and this was one thing that I focused on in my research, was to show that most exposures to pesticides are never reported. In some cases, folks are exposed to pesticides but don't experience acute symptoms of exposure, so they don't report it. In other cases, folks experience pesticide exposure, go to a health clinic, and the clinic staff either can't or won't attribute those symptoms to pesticide exposure for various reasons. What I also found is that social inequalities in many agricultural communities also render pesticide drift invisible and kind of um, 
uh, curtail a, a, a huge amount of pesticide exposures from being revealed in official um, data and documentation on the scope of the problem. For example, in um, California's immigrant farm working communities, high rates of poverty and fear of, associated fear of job loss make a lot of folks afraid of reporting pesticide exposure for, for fear of um, retaliation from their employers. Issues with legal status when a worker or someone else in their family, or not just a worker, but anyone living in, in one of these communities, if someone in their household lacks legal status, they may be afraid of approaching law enforcement and reporting uh, pesticide exposure. Uh, Well-documented patterns of racism um, that are experienced by immigrant communities also affect the degree to which um, clinical staff, regulatory officials, and other officials will take seriously the problems experienced by immigrant farm workers and their families. And then another thing that I documented in my work was a regulatory culture of industry protection and dismissiveness towards residents who express concerns about pesticides, particularly at the local level. So a lot of different things going on there. Kind of one way to sum this up is that we need, and this is an argument that I made through my work, is that we need stronger pesticide regulations to account for the influence of all of these different social inequalities and relations of oppression. That we know enough to know the official understandings of the scope of the problem, doubt, um, kind of underplay the the extent to which pesticides drift and to which people are exposed to them. So these kinds of findings, we can use these to help justify precaution-based restrictions on the use of the most toxic and drift-prone pesticides. So second key lesson, um, many people are asking the wrong questions when it comes to pesticides. When I talk about pesticide drift and political conflict over it, so many folks express their concerns about this by thinking and talking about what to buy and what to eat. And I argue that this is a dangerous approach to expressing concern about chemical pesticide exposure. These questions, what to buy, what to eat, frame these problems as market-based ones, that if we could just get our purchasing decisions right, then we could nip these problems in the bud. Many people who I've observed and interacted with even explicitly dismiss the potential for regulatory reform as a waste of time. And I get it, especially in light of the incredible amount of regulatory rollback that we've witnessed in the past few years and really over the last couple decades. And yet framing regulatory reform as a waste of time also lets government off the hook absolving it of its responsibility for stronger regulations that protect all people. And this is a trend that sacrifices those who can't vote with their dollars, who cannot um, afford to purchase organic and otherwise healthier foods and move away from places that are chemically intensive. So I'm not, I want to be clear about one thing. One thing is that I'm not saying that market-based ways of helping to address pesticides like supporting organic agriculture are bad. I mean, to the contrary, these are really important things. What I'm saying is that they're not enough. That we need carrots and sticks. The danger comes when we only think about the carrots and forget about the sticks, when we only think about market incentives and choices in the marketplace and not about regulations. So this brings me to my last point, which is that to support environmental justice, we need to fight for stronger environmental regulations. And the EJ, um, various EJ movements have emphasized that economic inequality and racism exclude many people, including those most burdened by agricultural pesticide pollution, from voting with their dollars and otherwise being able to be protected by the current system. So they call for stronger regulations as the socially just way to address environmental problems, or at least as an essential component of a socially just approach to addressing environmental problems. So environmental justice requires pushing regulatory agencies to implement EJ reforms across agency practice that will reduce, systematically reduce environmental hazards in the most vulnerable and environmentally overburdened communities. Many agencies are working on this, but their progress is really disappointing 
So this has been the focus of my latest research, which is looking at government agencies' environmental justice reform efforts, including extensive interviews with and observations of government agency staff. And in my work, I've been explaining why these agencies' progress on environmental justice reforms has been so slow, and I've been offering recommendations for improvement in that capacity. I've published this through my new book. So again, I'll drop a link to that in the chat. The bottom line that I wanna emphasize is just that justice requires that we continue to push government agencies to implement robust environmental justice reforms, including stronger regulations on the most toxic and most drift prone pesticides. I'll stop there. Thank you very much and look forward to the rest of the panel and the conversation. Thank you so much, Jill, for sharing your, your research and your knowledge on this topic is, is so important. So thank you. And I know I definitely have some questions for you at the end. Um, so our next speaker is AJ Carrillo, and I'll let him take it away. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to PPAN, and thank you, Jill, for that excellent talk. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is AJ Carrillo. I'm with Deer Tree Farm and Agroforest. My wife and I have a small regenerative family farm over here in Hotchkiss. Um, I'm also a board member of VOGA, the Valley Organic Growers Association. And so um, our organization is aimed at um, educating and supporting sustainable agriculture in our little agricultural valley over here. Uh, we're we occupy what I fondly refer to as the banana belt of Colorado. You know, um, we have an opportunity to grow um, really excellent quality uh, fruit. We have a lot of uh, peaches and apples, stone fruit over here. And, um, and everybody's heard the Palisade peach, you know, Palisade is just down the road from us. And so it's, um, it has the most, um, agricultural small family farms basically per capita in Colorado. So we have this really special little ecological niche over here. And so, so we are in an agricultural area that uses pesticides in order to produce, um, you know, good quality food for the state and for the country. But, you know, what, what I wanna kind of talk about today is um, the benefits of, yes, organic agriculture, um, yes, sustainable agriculture, but really starting to push that mindset towards um, looking at what regenerative agriculture really looks like, you know, um, what that means. And so when we're talking about pet, um, pollinators, we're talking about uh, a member of our ecosystem, right? And I don't say ecosystems, because when you start looking at different ecosystems, when you get into that boundary, into the middle, things get really blurred. And it becomes pretty obvious pretty quick that we are a part of one ecosystem here. And in agriculture, we as farmers and agriculturalists are managing ecosystems, okay? And I, that's just a really important point for us to remember. And that within an ecosystem, you have a um, set of relationships and interconnectedness. And when people talk about ecosystems, they're like, you know, there's plants and there's animals, you know, and then, yeah, and then, uh, and then there's some humans over there. And so I kind of want to remind everyone that we are part of our ecosystem, right? We've always been here uh, as long as we've been around, you know, we, we come from it and we're a part of it. And to be in agriculture is to be managing ecosystems, right? And so, so when we have a um, issue within an ecosystem, um, like our pollinator issue, like our public health issue, like our social issues, we can understand those a little bit better by um, taking a uh, systems thinking approach. Okay, so there are two types of systems. There are uh, complicated systems like my iPad, like my phone, like um, my lamp. You know, you push the button and it goes boop, and you know, the thing that you wanted it to do happens. And if it doesn't happen, then you can trace through the processes and find the flaw fix the flaw and then it happens again. So that's complicated. 
right? It's machines are complicated. Then you have complex systems. Now, complex systems are defined, <laughs> or one of the ways you can think of a complex system is that unintended consequences are the norm, right? So you push this button and you expect this to happen over here, and then you push it and then poof, something happens over there. And whoa, well, how did that happen? Why did that happen? We have no idea. Things don't have one-to-one -one relationship cause and effects. There is a, a total, uh, that interconnected web begins to be affected in ways that we can't foresee. So when we are looking at pesticides and we're looking at pollinator issues, it's, it's more than just um, looking at like, oh, we're spreading, we're spraying pesticides and they're causing issues to the overall health of the situation. We kind of need to look back at what are those root causes that we're, um, why are we using pesticides to begin with? Why, why are pesticides uh, necessary in our modern agriculture? Um, and then we can, you know, start, start looking at the causes that pesticides have. And really when, when we are looking at complex systems and we're looking at how do we address problems and how do we uh, achieve our goals, right? We have goals, we have our values, we're trying to um, uh, achieve our goals based on our values within complex systems. A really helpful way of approaching that is through what's called uh, holistic thinking or uh, holistic planning or holistic management. Okay, so if we as agriculturalists are managing ecosystems, then how do we set up our management and plan our management to achieve the goals we're looking to achieve according to our values? Okay, so, um, so if, if what we're talking about here is we're trying to address uh, a triple bottom line, we're trying to have ecological health, we're trying to have public and social health, and also as farmers and as people within the larger complex uh, economy and society, these are all complex systems, right? We're also looking to make a good livelihood and to be able to support our families. And so our enterprises must also be uh, economically profitable or viable. All right, so you have a triple bottom line. You have social health, you have ecological health, and you have economic health. All right, and economics is, I would argue, a natural system because it's a human system and we're nature, we're natural. Okay, so, um, so we start seeing a pattern within modern agriculture, um, uh, conventional agriculture, even though it's extremely new in the grand scheme of things, that, um, that we can trace that pattern all the, all the way back to the beginning of agriculture, which is human beings move into a um, natural ecosystem, a viable perennial ecosystem, and we um, eradicate the life there through generally through tillage. And then we impose our, um, you know, we plant our hard seeds that are from annual plants, which means you put them in the ground and you get a seed within the same year. We store those seeds and, um, and then around that becomes uh, agriculture, becomes cities and civilization, okay? So this is the, the pattern that we're looking at over time. So as we till and as we uh, erode native and natural ecosystems, um, there starts being serious consequences, okay? And so one of the consequences of tillage and one of the consequences of um, monocropping or focusing on one crop, taking a diverse ecosystem and focusing on one crop is that um, you deplete your soil health. And um, soil is, the, um, is our inflection point, our point of leverage into the ecosystem. Um, as agriculturalists, as farmers, we are working with the earth, literally the soil, we're working with it. And so if our practices are destroying soils, then 
we have to realize soil is a living thing. It's not some inert dirt. It's a, a interconnected net of life. It's an organism. So if we're damaging that life organism, then what ends up happening is the plants become unhealthy and the animals that eat the plants become unhealthy. And when you have an unhealthy plant in an ecosystem, nature's way of taking care of the overall health of the ecosystem is to send pests, right? So if you have an unhealthy plant, it sends out a vibration that basically attracts pests to it. And um, that's, that's, that's where we're gonna have a big issue. So the health issue that we're talking about is starting with the ground and how we treat the ground. Uh, I just saw a comment, you know, kiss the ground movie, check it out, really informative. Um, and it's talking about this, how like that soil is really the basis of our life, basis of our civilization. And so when we are talking about regenerative agriculture, what we're talking about is how do we engage with the soil, with our ecosystem in a way that is no longer destructive, no longer degradating our resource base, our home, but aggrading our soil, building soil, contributing to the health of our soils. And um, so how do you do that, right? If it's a complex ecosystem, how are you supposed to, uh, how are you supposed to do that? Well, you look at nature, you look at how our natural ecosystems, you wanna talk about sustainability and uh, uh, resilience to climate change? Our natural, natural ecosystem on this planet have withstood six ice ages. That's climate resilience right there. And they've done it without spending a dime, you know? So it's without any outside inputs being put into it. So we look at the, um, the relationships that promote abundance um, occurring within nature. And so what they, uh, in a holistic management, you need to look at your overall context. What's your climate? What's your economic context? What's your social context? All these sorts of things. And you develop a plan according to your context, according to your values. And so there are certain practices that you can use by, by understanding the patterns that occur within your native context, replicating them, tweaking them to fit your values, but using those patterns to create an agricultural ecosystem where you are reintegrating the, um, the dynamic processes that create soil, that create health, that create abundance within a human human managed system. So it's kind of this concept of we're changing from maintenance where we're maintaining, I have to have perfect rows and I have to have my trees look exactly like this and I have to blah, 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 lots of work basically um, from maintenance to management. You're managing a, an ecosystem that will provide the things that nature has always provided to human beings. Food, feed, fuel, fiber, medicine, building material, building materials, happiness, joy, good things. Um, all of these things that's providing to us while providing ecosystem services like um, purifying water, purifying air, um, these sorts of good things. Okay, so the trick is how do we develop Develop these ecosystems, agricultural ecosystems, in a way that is profitable because that triple bottom line are the three legs of the stool of regeneration. If it's not economically viable, then it cannot sustain itself and it can't be regenerative. So it needs to be profitable while building soils, while providing extremely healthy food for our communities. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear what uh, Jason has to say uh, about this, but a lot of opportunities become to begin to arise when you have an abundance model um, where people can work trade. There's lots of abundance. There's lots of opportunities to be profitable and to be generous because you're generating a lot. And so, um, so this is kind of the overall, you know, looking at the root cause of why are we using pesticides? You know, it's because we're destroying our ecosystems. So how can we manage our ecosystems in a better way 
in a profitable manner. And that's what we're trying to do here at Deer Tree Farm and Agroforest, using agroforestry practices, using um, those integrated models. Agroforestry is a really wonderful way to integrate those systems. So right now we have plants, annuals, orchards, and animals, and they're all separated. So agroforestry is utilizing your trees, your tree crops, which are your long-term crops, integrating your animals um, through that system. And the animals are your cohorts, they're your coworkers. So all of our neighbors, we have a lot of pest issues, right? Well, if you have a lot of pest problems, one thing that you can, uh, one mindset and paradigm that you can change is that you don't need more pesticides. What you need are more birds. You know, we got too many moths, you got too much larva, it's, it's attacking the system. So we can run birds to the system. And from those birds, they can go in and get all the omega-3s and all the good fats from those insects and turn them into dark, rich, orange yolked eggs or wonderful, um, humanely raised and butchered meat. Our pigs, we run our pigs through our orchard at the end of the season and they clean up all those fallen peaches and reduce all of those pests that will hibernate there over winter or the molds that develop there. So you have pest and disease management, you have fertility. Rather than buying totes by the ton of pelletized chicken manure, why not turn, instead of paying for that input, turn it into an income for your farmers and run your birds through there, run your ruminants through there to develop that soil health. So really we're looking at redesigning our agriculture in order to address the root causes. And when we address those root causes, there's my timer, I don't wanna go on too long, but in order to address the root cause of pesticide use, we need to inc increase soil health so that pesticide use, you know, we outgrow it. And from that, you can see that cascading effect of, of positivity that comes from there. So, you know, being in a rural environment here in Hotchkiss, I have seen my neighbors, uh, you know, elder farmers um, succumb to, to uh, cancer and to serious illnesses. And I've heard uh, that and witnessed our water companies maintaining the ditches with pretty hardcore uh, pesticides and herbicides. And so starting to readjust our mind and our paradigm to work towards that holistic ecological approach and starting to adjust it where it's like, not as some of my old timey neighbors say, just like some hippy dippy nonsense. Like, no, it's actually good business to maintain your resource base in a way that will make you more abundant means that you have a higher price point for some people and you also have a higher production so that that food can go out at a lower price point to other people. So it kind of addresses equality, social justice, it addresses your uh, environmental justice. And then in, at the same time, all that wild space out there, we need to leave it alone because everything we have, we can feed our population and take care of ourselves with everything we've already touched we need to leave everything else alone. So um, I look forward to discussing this more. I'm sure you can all tell I'm a total nerd for these, these things. So thank you so much for listening to me and um, look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. So turn it over to y'all. Uh, thank you so much, AJ. Great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed learning more about this holistic approach and systems thinking. It's so interesting and really important. So thank you. And our next presenter is Jason August, and I'll let him go right ahead. Thank you. Hey, hey Jason. Jason, you're on mute. You've been on mute, just so you know. Thank you very much, Fatima. Thank you, AJ. Well, let me start all over. Great to be here with everybody, AJ. And um, Jill, thank you so much for sharing that. I've learned so much. Um, you covered so much um, information that, you know, I won't really go back over, but maybe highlight some of the, some of the points that you brought up. But really today, um, I want to talk to you guys about frontline farming and piling ideas. 
and um, the work that we do and how we kind of cross over um, our ideas. Like, you know, the bees take the pollen and the dragonflies and the wind and like, you know, us people were the major pollinators, you know, of ideas of how they move around from one group of people to another group of people. And then they, 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 they um, percolate with each other. And then you have, boof, you have a brand new, just like system or idea. And that's what we're really about making those cross um, connections with other people, organizations, institutions, um, really to bring about the change that we want to see in our society. Um, so Frontline Farming, about us, we're a BIPOC and women-led organization. BIPOC, for those who do not know, is Black, Indigenous, People of Color organization and a women led organization. Um, There's a picture right here of some of our crew. Um, we started um, about two years ago, but have been doing the work um, for at least years before that, 10 years or so before that. Um, and we really work towards food sovereignty, um, farmer liberation, um, farmer advocacy, and food justice. Um, we cultivate about five acres of land throughout Denver. Um, so we have a two-acre parcel in the Denver metro area in Arvada, another um, acre and a third in um, off of 52nd and Federal in unincorporated Adams County, and then in South Denver, another small um, three-quarters of an acre plot. So with that, we're able to, like, you know, get our message and get our produce and our ideas out throughout the whole city of Denver and across the whole front range. Um, if I could go to the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, so we have this framework that we really kind of like put everything um, in and that is a trifold framework. And really we deal with food security, um, food justice and food um, sovereignty. So basically with our food security, we have programs, you can go to the next slide, Fa, um, that really deal with um, addressing the, the needs of people in real time. Because we know that food security is something that is a kind of like in the here and now with a lot of people. So we know that it's not a long-term solution, but we still need to address the, the needs of the people now. So some of the ways that we do that and also getting, going back to the pollination of these ideas is like, you know, how do we get the idea of people need food, you know, out into the out into the world, you know, even though it should be so obvious, but how do we get people to do work? Um, the same work that we do, like, you know, it's by action, by doing the work and people seeing doing the work and be like, oh, I could do that too in my community and taking that model and that idea and, and doing it. So for example, we, um, we work with the Denver Food Rescue with a no cost grocery program where we um, distribute about, let's say about a thousand pounds a week of food. And it's been fluctuating a lot with COVID in the beginning. It kind of like went down a lot we saw, but then now things seem to be picking back up a little bit with the food. Um, and we ran a, a distribution um, grocery out of our, our um, farm. But when COVID hit, we had to like kind of like change that model and really partner up and cross um, activate with some other organizations which is really good because we saw that it really like, it is just, just expanded and amplified our reach. Whereas we were reaching, let's say 40 or so, 30 to 40 families per week, um, every Monday for the past two or three years since the COVID, that number has probably tripled or quadrupled um, just in terms of, and, and just in terms of the, the, the people that we've been, we've been out getting the food to. So we've been um, getting the food to like immigrant um, communities, indigenous families, um, people in Southwest Denver. So our expansion has really um, amplified. Um, so there's some numbers here that I don't really need to bore you guys with. Um, and we just try to keep it equitable um, and fair for everybody um, in our old program. So then we also do our healing foods program. Thank you, Fatima. Um, and that is pretty much where we donate about a third or a quarter to a third of our food to programs that support women and children um, organizations, immigrant communities, um, people who are really in need. Um, so we partner with um, First Step, Warren Village, um, Safe House Denver, Cultivando, Family Tree. Um, we also donate a lot of our food to food banks, Metro Caring, the Arvada Food Bank. Um, we do educational classes with Cooking Matters. And in response to COVID-19, it's even been more critical for us to like, you know, step in into these places and really like, you know, provide this kind of like, you know, motivation and also food for, for the people 
um, in need. If I could go to our next slide, thank you. Um, food justice, you know, and that is really the work that we do on a, a policy level, on the actual, like, you know, in rooms, uh, making decisions that will have effects on communities um, in the future. Pardon me. I'm hearing an echo from my cell phone, just my backup phone. Um, so we really try to appeal to like, you know, the system. If you're like, oh my gosh, the system is so vast and so, so kind of like unchangeable. That's not true. It is very changeable. It's, this needs to be disrupted, disrupted with the right type of um, interjection of the right type of vibration, you know, and the right type of thought and energy into like, you know, the work that really needs to be done. Yeah, it's hard, you know, to go into some of these rooms and let our voices be heard, but that's what we have to do because we're, we're, we're representing not only ourselves, but we're re representing our communities. You know, we're representing farmers, we're representing immigrants, we're representing black indigenous people of color. We're representing uh, people who are just out there just trying to live and survive and live healthy. So we have voices of many people and we have to like, you know, project and let our voices be heard. So some of the policy work that we do is um, really, let me just back up for a second. Um, not even on the policy work, but one of the things that we do is now is this Project Protect Food Systems um, work. And that is a whole thing that we're doing across the state, um, really trying to like just secure um, the resources needed for our immigrant farm workers across the state. We were down there in your region in the Palisades and down in the San Luis Valley, the Southeast region. Um, we we're in the North, um, AJ, um, Southeast, I'm talking about you, AJ, Palisades, we were down there. Um, we have been all across the state setting up this network, kind of like if you think of a mycelium network and how that network propagates throughout, you know, and information just jumps and lapses and things kind of like, you know, happen. Um, and there's always like, you know, kind of like, you know, that, that core and where things branch out from. So we came together with a group of um, concerned, you know, Coloradans from um, different institutions, individuals to really put this in motion and we've been doing the work um, throughout the state. And we have a social movements team. Um, we have a policy team, a data team, a funding team, just to really make sure that this message of protection for our ag workers during this time of COVID and beyond really gets, gets out um, into, the, into the system. You know, so that's one way we kind of like work within the system. Also like being on some of these task force, like the Colorado Farm and Food Systems Response Team you know, just making sure that, you know, that we get funding to our farmers, you know, our farmers and our BIPOC farmers, you know, and we've had about three rounds of grants giving away almost like $2 million, you know, to, to farmers and different people throughout the state in this COVID time. Um, the last round just closed. So, you know, I hope people were able to know about it and apply for it. Um, we also work on our good food pro pro policy, um, purchasing policy with the city of Denver, making sure that um, there is room for local procurement of good food for, you know, the people and these communities who don't have access to it, you know, and I hear the word food desert a lot. And I just really want to just stop and pause and let people kind of like talk about back to pollination of ideas. So here's just a little seed. We don't, we don't deal with food deserts, you know, because what's a desert? A desert is full of life. People live there for thousands of years. We have ecosystems in there. So to put this thing and saying that the desert is a place of lack, it's like a disservice to our communities. We have to call it what it really is. And what is it? It's a system. It's an apartheid system. It's a food apartheid system that's been put in place in these communities nationwide to keep people on a certain level, you know, unhealthy, low economic status. Like I could go down the list and the list of it, we see it. So I don't need to like hit you in the head with it. But just to kind of like, you know, just really know that we're dealing with like the system. So to call it a food desert is just like something. So please get that, that, get, get that name out your, out your, your mind. And anytime you hear somebody say it, be like, no, it's in a food apartheid system because this put in place to keep people down. Um, if I could go to the um, next slide. And we also work with the Mahai farmers, like, you know, our different areas um, out here in Denver. Um, our ED, Fatima is the president. Um, Damien, one of our co-founders, as well as sits on our equity committee. Um, 
I serve on the leadership committee as well. So we try to like, you know, really interject ourselves to really like push our ideas out to people and let the people see the work and people like gravitated towards goodness, you know, towards like progression into growth. And this kind of leads us into our next thing about sovereignty. And what is that? Liberation, you know, mental liberation, spiritual liberation, economic liberation, you know, food liberation, health liberation, because we're all in this toxic environment, you know, so we all have to kind of like pull each other up and pull each other out, you know, so some of the stuff that we hold around liberation is kind of like, if I go to the next slide, um, it's kind of like our education, you know, we want to educate people's minds, so we deal with herbs, we have a herbalism session, um, plug real quick, Thursday, Planets and Herbs, Check out our website, frontlinefarming.org slash events. We have a dope um, herb plants and herbs um, session coming up, dealing with astrology and the plants and healing and yourself and your signs. So just a real plug for that really quick. Um, we'll drop that in the chat for those who are interested. But we have community classes um, where we deal with education. We have a beekeeping series. We have, you know, grow your own backyard farm. Um, we have um, <clears throat> chicken keeping. We have cooking classes with um, cooking matters where we teach people how to use the produce that we grow to, to teach and grow healthy meals. Because you may get something and you may not know how to use it or what's this, the beneficial health benefits of it. You know, you can say like, oh, this is good for my eyesight. Oh, let me chop these up, you know. I swear by baby carrots, man. I, real quick story. A couple of seasons ago, I just went really hard on baby carrots, right? And see, I wear glasses. I went to the eye doctor to get my annual eye check. They were like, I've never seen this before in my life. Yet my eye vision went in reverse. And I just attributed to those baby, baby carrots, you know, just those baby carotines from my eyes, you know, and just good vibes. So some of those classes. Um, and then also dealing with sovereignty for our people, we have the Black and Brown Growers Collective. You know, because there's a lot of us out there in Colorado who are doing the work, doing these regenerative practices, um, really going back to our ancient ways of like, you know, making our own pesticides, you know, without chemicals, using some cayenne pepper and some uh, little dash of vinegar and some garlic powder and some like, you know, nice, sudsy, like clean, like Dr. Brown is like, you know, soap. I'm giving you guys a recipe. Hope you paid attention, you know. So really like um, just trying to use those natural elements from our ancestors in our past, but also as a collective to support one another and to do the work of, um, empowerment for our people across like, you know, the state and across my say our people, I mean our farmers, our black and brown farmers, this our farming community. We also deal with education and like bringing power to our bioregional food ways. We have um, food ways where we teach more ideas about where the, the food systems like really evolved from the system, who were the originators of it. It goes back to slavery, you know, and then it transfers to like, you know, Jim Crow era. And then we have like, you know, farm agricultural workers from the Brazero programs, the same kind of like system, but we want to like bring out the pride in it and show them that, you know, people came over from like the continent with seeds. A lot of the foods that we eat are transplanted and pollinated by people, going back to pollination. A lot of the melons, a lot of the greens, they were brought over by, by people like tucking stuff in like, you know, their hair, you know, their locks and their hair and their braids and hiding seeds all around them. And so we in our farms like really want to educate people about this history. So we have a, a food waste of African food waste where we grow foods from the, the diaspora, from the Caribbean, from the African continent, just to teach people about the rich history and culture. We also have a Arab foods ways where we grow food from the Middle East just to, to, to show people about the, the richness of the food from that part of the world. We also have a, um, a bioregional zone as well to show about the, the foods that grow in this region of Colorado in the Four Corners. And then we also have our Three Sisters area, which is one of my favorites to get lost in like the corn and to, the corn and the beans and the cucurbit squash from the bottom to really like um, grow soil on um, my next slide. You know, thank you, Fatima, for keeping me moving on time. Um, going back to what AJ was saying, you know, growing soil, you know, that, that from like, you know, the gut, the microbes, like, you know, in the soil, it's like we, it won't grow if it's dirt, you know, we grow soil. So, but we want to grow healthy soil. 
with good like you know mycelium and good nutrients and microbiomes because we're growing that food that goes into our body but those same microbes are going into ourselves so we're all going back to what aj was saying we're all one ecosystem it's one system one planet we're just kind of like you know just in it doing ourselves if you think of your body you know think about that you know we may be like the soul system and our heart is like the planet and another part the the mycelium network is like our is our neurons and stuff like that so it's all connected like you know from the macro to the micro it's all the same just in different variations so we really have to remember that people go back one more slide for me Fa. i'm sorry um so it's going back to that you know with our carbon sequestration we build our soil and our compost um going back to pollinated sunflowers i love sunflowers you know i, I really want to be the george washington carver of sunflowers one day in my life not this lifetime or next lifetime but really find out like the the infinite uses of the sunflower um, and really like to attract the bees, the honey flowers, I mean, the, the butterflies, you know, to really bring that natural ecosystem back into our farm, into our spaces. And it's like a lot of work, but it's, it's doable because nature is a beast. You know, nature is the, the, the true, like, you know, winner of everything all. We may do our little things here and there, but once we're gone, it'll just keep on regenerating and regenerating. So we want to regenerate with it. Fine, next slide, please. I may have a couple more minutes. Um, farmer advocacy um that's the one thing we really really drove highs to is like how do we advocate for farmers but we got to start with ourselves you know so we believe in paying our farmers a living wage providing health insurance um year-round salary for our, our farming staff um the farmers still on our board and then we vote so it's like a whole kind of like you know way of, of working that we're like creating as we go along you know, but based on like principles that are solid and groundation that have proven to work, but also kind of like chip away and get away of all the nonsense. So some of the things that we do, like just going back to culture and pollination from people all around the world is um, we will have a, a potluck series. Um, hopefully once this thing subsides, to be honest, people, I think things will get back to normal for another like year or two, maybe before we're back to like, you know, really getting back to one another. But for them, we have Zoom and we have energy and we have good vibes. So um, we have our World Potluck Heritage where we invite people from different communities at our celebration farm because it's heavy populated with immigrants from all around the world. Um, so last year we had um, one of Mario from Bosnia prepared a beautiful meal of his home cooking and he told stories from his comb and stuff that he went through when people came in. We had people from China we had a potluck series from Ethiopia and Yemen. Um, and we had a one from South Sudan. So just to bring the international vibe and of the world and these cultural heritages and food that we could bring and share and cross pollinate our cultures in our uh, society and our work. Um, so I don't wanna talk for too long. I could keep on going on, but I know we have about 15 minutes left. So I just wanna stop right here and say, thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Um, check out our website, frontlinefarming.org. Follow us on social media, Frontline Farming, on Facebook, Instagram, and Project Protect um, will be in the link. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, and thank you for pointing out the, the usage of the term uh, food, food desert. I realized that, you know, I use that term in my intro for this webinar, and I've heard that term used by, you know, other students in my program and professors, and, and you're so right, the language that we use to um, explain these issues is so important. And, you know, when you, when you hear food desert, you think of, you know, something that has just naturally occurred, that it's just that way. But you're so right, it, it's not naturally occurring. Um, it's, it's a system of oppression and it's maintained and it's continued to be maintained, um, you know, until we take action and make those changes. So, so thank you for reframing that for me and pointing that out in great presentation. Um, yeah, thank you to all our presenters. Thank you just so much for, for taking the time to, to come here with us and present all your knowledge and your experience. Um, it's so much appreciated. And I know I learned so much from, from all of you guys today. So thank you, thank you. Um, and before we hop into doing questions, um, I just wanted to 
uh, let you guys know about um, a petition that PPAN is trying to get some signatures for. We are we have a petition uh, to create a pollinator license plate for Colorado, and uh, this is super important. The uh, funds for this will be. Uh, donated to going towards creating more pollinator habitat and to um, maintain and protect pollinator habitat. Uh, so we're going to drop the link uh, to that in the chat so that you guys can access that. Um, if you have a car registered in Colorado, you can sign this petition. So we'd really, really appreciate it if you would just take a moment to do that. Um, and also, if you really enjoy um, attending these monthly educational webinars that we put on, um, we really appreciate it if you would consider uh, donating to PPAN so we can keep providing these educational webinars to you all. Um, and the link to donate is also at our website um, on, at peopleandpollinators.org. So we'll drop those links in the chat for you. And now we're just gonna get to some of your all's questions for our presenters. So let me pull those up really quick. Kind of been keeping track. Let's see. So one of the first questions that we received, and I think this one is uh, aimed towards you, Jill, was um, how do we educate and empower workers to feel confident in whistle whistleblowing? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a great question. And I wrote down a bunch of ideas about it because I think the answer is kind of complicated. I mean, on the one hand, um, feeling confident to whistleblow, whether it's in regard to pesticide exposure in the workplace or some other injustice in the workplace, um, we can help boost that confidence and those skills in workers by educating them about their rights and about training them on proper pesticide um, use practices. There's a lot of money um, being spent on educating farm workers about how to use pesticides properly. Um, so I'll say, yeah, those are great things. Um, in fact, EPA just recently, just today, announced a whole several million dollars coming to the Western states for exactly at least that kind of kind of technical training. Um, and then there's certainly training to be done on legal rights too among farm workers. But I also, I wanna question the question, which is I'm not sure that this is so much an issue of confidence as it is an issue of power. And um, so we can talk about educating each other, but there's also some serious power asymmetries that exist within and beyond the agricultural workplace that, um, produce the problem of people not being able to speak out in defense of themselves and in protection of their right to live without being harmed by chemicals and otherwise being exploited. So, um, so a couple of things along those lines. Um, one is there are a lot of organizations out there that support farm workers. Um, I'm most familiar with the ones in California, but I know that there's a whole bunch around the United States so they deserve our support and strength and kind of coalition building as much as anything else. Um, other thoughts about how to build power among farm working communities, including include supporting farm working unions, um, immigrant rights advocacy organizations fighting for strengthening immigrant rights um, uh, kind of formally in the policy arena and fighting against um, xenophobic and hateful uh, immigration um, reforms that have been made and kind of um, erasing some of those and strengthening the rights of different immigrant groups. Um, also fighting for stronger labor rights in general for immigrant workers and others. So that includes things like increasing minimum wage for all workers, but also strengthening the rights of some of our most marginalized workers, including farm workers who don't have the right to collectively organize the way that most other workers in the United States do. Um, strengthening workers' rights will also include um, fighting against so-called right-to-work legislation that's been um, kind of unfolding across the United States at a breakneck pace that deeply erodes the rights of so many different groups of workers. Um, 
And then finally, I would say we have, this is your question also um, just reinforces my point about the need for stronger pesticide regulations. If we had stronger pesticide regulations, we wouldn't have so many people getting poisoned in the first place and needing to defend themselves. So that's also part of that suite of activities that we need. Um, but I appreciate the question. Absolutely, great answer. Um, so our next question, let me grab it here. Okay, so our next question was, and I, and I think this kind of applies to all of you, um, anyone can take this question, um, but how about holding companies that sell food more accountable? Companies, uh, companies can lobby for, far more than grassroots can. Uh, they have lawyers that can go up against governmental roadblocks. What do you guys think about this question? Uh, I'll take a first stab at it. I think um, first it's the right company. Which company are you talking about? Because you have to have a company. You have to find a company that's in your uh, alignment and with your interests. You know, because you have a co corporate company like Monsanto or some or one of the subsidiaries that's like, you no, know, all for pesticides and saying, oh, it's the best thing because da 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 da. You know, so it's really like aligning yourself with like you know these companies that you may may know about or find or maybe like you know say like, oh, I, I like buying them. Like you know, I believe what they they stand for. And doing that kind of like you know research to like you know make those relationships with those people inside those organizations and see how you know they can <clears throat> further like you know support the work whether it's like you know putting their name behind you or if they have any power in like you know some of these like you know coalitions or groups you know so i'd really say like you know making sure you know the people that you're working with and that they're in alignment with your, your values Yeah, I think probably just uh, jumping off of that, drafting off of it, um, getting to know the people who you're working with. You know, um, uh, this global centralized um, system has been developing for a while, but what our heritage is as people is local community, regional um, uh, ecosystems of people and um, economies. And so, um, Oh, you know, I get overwhelmed when I think about, you know, these huge organizations and lobbies and lawyers and laws and, you know, and kind of like, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And then you can talk about um, who are your farmers? Where are you getting your food? Can you visit that farm? Can you uh, see what they're doing? Can you ask them about their practices? Can you go there and work and get a little bit of uh, soil therapy? You know, um, can you go to somewhere like frontline farming and talk with them and ask about who they're working with? Can you go to somewhere like Voga here in the North Fork Valley and, and look through the directory and find someone who um, is in alignment with your values and, um, and then start that conversation yeah, the grassroots organizations don't have as much power to lobby, but people have, and customers have a lot of sway over small family organizations. And so I feel like cultivating that grassroots um, uh, more, just like cultivating your community uh, more and being an active participant in it, it can be very powerful for your own health, your own region, your own community and uh, you can actually have influence over your farmers and have that direct relationship. And I could tell stories about that, how folks have asked me this or other farmers that, and ultimately, um, you know, we as a farm, we don't even certify organic. I don't need to certify organic, I'm customer certified. So if someone wants, wants to know how it is, they can ask me and I'll show them. If someone wants, uh, wants something different, we can have a conversation. So, you know, when you have that close network of relationships, that's more possible. And then you can encourage that health or those things that you're looking for. So a little two cents there for you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, AJ. And I think, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. And that's something that's really important to PPAN too. It's you know, getting these grassroots organizations together and you have more powers and numbers, making those connections and making those partnerships is so important. 
Um, so our next question is, are there any legislative or are there any efforts in the legislative slash regulatory arena on the forefront? What's that? I don't know if any of our panelists want to take that or if you want Joyce, to I was wondering it. if you wanted to speak to that. Yeah. Even what we were talking about before the call started. So we at PPAN has been building momentum to introduce more policies over time. Uh, the first one was more habitat related, the pollinator highway. Last session, we introduced a pesticide preemption repeal bill. We were unable to bring that to conclusion because of COVID. And that's something we want to continue to work on. We're trying to look at what pesticide related regenerative agriculture sorts of policies would have the most broad ranging impacts. And uh, that was why we talked about the preemption one. And if anybody wants to learn more about that, I can talk about that offline. Um, and I was telling presenters just before we're running the pollinator license plate bill this coming session, just because it's very, going to be very difficult to run any more substantial bills in a session that's going to be interrupted. And so strategically, it would have been difficult for us to reintroduce the pesticide preemption repeal. But we're always on the hunt for bills that we can introduce um, and policies that we can work with municipalities on. So we're very open to discussing those concepts with people. And I'd add, um, so I also noted that Rich Andrews here posted in the chat about a recent bill to reform FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. That's a major federal statute that governs um, pesticide regulations in the United States at the federal level and then states and then some municipalities can implement more stringent regulations on top of that. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, there's other organizations too that are that have more bandwidth to be more active on policy and regulatory reform at the federal level and state levels. Pesticide Action Network North America is one of those. They're a wonderful organization that I support or um, and beyond pesticides also. So if, um, if any of you are, are interested in kind of investing more and following more some of those regulatory and policy reform efforts, those are good organizations to follow and pay attention to and you can help support the work that they're doing. And I'd love to hear from others here about other suggestions they have on. Just one other add on would be that we launched an environmental health coalition last year and it's open doors. Um, it's trying to build this strength for the intersection uh, between all the issues we're talking about today. And so um, we're, PPAN's pretty focused on the toxic pesticides issue, but others in the group have other toxins that they're concerned about. Um, so again, that's another initiative that we need the strength of many organizations working together if we're going to move policies like this along at the state legislature. I just wanted to go back. I realize I uh, missed an earlier question. Um, so this is from somebody asking from the St. Louis area. For people not local to Denver, are there resources on how to start something like frontline farming in our areas? Oh, oh. That's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are people out there doing the work. I'm sure you're doing the work. It's just a matter of like, you know, organizing yourself and your, your team and your, your good, like, you know, core. And if people are willing to like, you know, do the work and a tactic on like um, these different levels, like, you know, I've mentioned earlier, we have our access arm and we have our justice policy arm. And then we have our sovereignty, which is the education and uh, work for our people. So you could more than help them use and expand on that framework. Or um, if you want to email me or text me, ja at frontlinefarming.org. Um, and we could like, you know, talk um, and you could just look at some of our, like, you know, our website and I could share some info with you on like, you know, just how we do, because we love to see this work, like, you know, replicated, because we're not trying to do this work for ourselves and only our community, but we need to like, you know, 
do this all over. You know, there was this book I read, like, you know, about gentrification and it says like, you know, Harlem ain't nothing but a third world country. And it just gave that kind of like, you know, example of like, you know, Harlem and but all over the country is these places being gentrified, but you know, the same way, like, you know, please like, you know, take our ideas and expand on them and make them better, you know, because we're all in this together. And it's like, you know, how we do the, the little, the least is how we're going to do the most. You know, so let us all like, you know, work together and like, you know, brain pick and cross pollinate and cross collaborate and like, you know, support each other when and how we can. Great, thank you. Um, I, I want to Danielle really oh, briefly. Yeah. Um, I didn't answer the question about how to take on corporate actors. And um, I heard the points that Jason and AJ made, which were great, but I would also just advocate for thinking about how your work is part of a broader political project. So it can feel really daunting mm -hmm. to try to confront major corporations as an individual, but less daunting when you join the efforts of other people who are already organizing along those lines. Um, and there are some great, great, really important, powerful ways in which people are collectively organizing to challenge uh, exploitative and otherwise irresponsible corporate actors. Um, and I'm going to drop into the chat here a recent book I'm a book person, sorry, but they are out in paperback, so they're um, more affordable nowadays. Um, I have a, a half of a chapter in this book, but the rest of it I recommend also in other ways because it's all about people taking on corporate actors in the food system um, to make for a more environmentally sustainable and socially just food system. And I think just kind of tailing off of that, uh, the organization that I represent, VOGA, Valley Organic um, Growers Association, um, part of why I'm glad to be a part of them is because we have a, a coalition of growers and that we can represent all of our organic or sustainable farmers when there is a uh, uh, oil company, when as the oil companies try to move into our watersheds, we have a collective voice, we have a reputation, we have an economic backing you know it's it's one thing if I show up I'm like hello you know but it's another thing where it's like me and these 43 farming entities and all of these people in agriculture disagree and we all agree on this and this is our plan this is our recommendation uh makes me feel a lot better um that i don't have to go up on that alone so appreciate that jill good one yeah and just to add on one more thing um what off of what aj was saying um this is old adage um, that Fatima Idi always says, one of her favorites, and I'll share it with you guys. Um, there's a one stick, you know, easily breakable, but if you bundle them up, you, you can't break it. Pardon me if I jack that up a little bit, Fatima, but you guys get the, the gist of it. Like, you know, individual, we're not as strong as we are when we're like collectively together. And just to go back um, with the, the question a little bit earlier about the corporate and like getting corporate, like, you know, support and lobbying. Um, sometimes like one of the things um, that we, we found is like, we can't really rely on corporations really because they may have some other agenda that we may not be aware of. So we really try to like can take those bundles that I was talking about just now, whether it be with the Mile High Farmers, Project Protect, um, different like, you know, black and brown growers or just different coalitions that we work with and attack it on the state, federal, um, state policy, like local and state policy level, even um, national, you know, I'm, I'm on the board, I'm not the board, but the policy, um, for the National Young Farmers. So we've been addressing like, you know, immigrant rights policy, um, climate change. So it's really kind of like, you know, taking those bundles, those individual bundles and making your own kind of like, you know, rock hard, like sword or whatever you want to call it, just that's unbreakable. And that's in like collective unity. So I salute you, um, AJ and Jill for the work that you're doing and bringing that up. Thank you. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, are, are, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Are you all okay taking like one more question? Okay, awesome. All right, so we got another question. Uh, do you frame your work within an environmental justice framework? Are you able to come up with some data to show pesticide impact? Is doing that work scary in a way in terms of the serious power that reinforces these systems? 
And yeah, that was for Jill. And just like the follow up was more data specific because we hear this constant number of the 300,000 and it's hard for us to get that reference point for our work. And I know it's hard because there isn't a causal relationship and you said that lot isn't reported, but I'm wondering if you use a number or data set um, that we could reference. Um, I'm actually not sure which 300,000 number you're referring to. Is that, could you explain that? For um, like pesticide um, Ill, co illnesses caused by pesticide use. Um, okay, yeah, so probably a, a number at the national scale. Um, I'd be happy to help you kind of connect to some of the data on that. So feel free to follow up with me individually. And that's the case for anybody else too. You're welcome to, to reach out to me and I'll see what I can do to help support your interest in rounding up data to support the work you're trying to do. That'd be great. And then just the power question is that, because we've been dealing with this with meatpacking industry and there's some real consequences um, even to individuals and in research and stuff. And just wondering how you navigate the realities of power. Yeah, it's a great question. And that's why the folks who I interviewed and studied in my work were people who had already decided on their own volition to become politically active around pesticide use. Um, so I wasn't going out and recruiting anybody who didn't want to be speaking with a researcher um, around pesticide politics. It's the concerns around power and retaliation and retribution are, are legitimate indeed. I'd love to jump on just um, uh, in another in another kind of a way too, just in the sense of um, farms are like um, can be the real world laboratories, and we can be we're already as farmers like you know our our job is already to go around and look at things and how's the grass doing after the sheep have been on there it should you know oh two days is too long but a day and a half is just right one day there's too much forage you know again i'm a complete dern for these things but we can be those real um scientists and data collectors on the ground and um something that i find really exciting is that um I'm seeing more and more farmers starting to share that knowledge and starting to um, exchange that data within bioregions and that that can, you know, you hear these um, recommendations like uh, put lime on your soil to combat the acidity. We're in an alkaline environment. You put lime on the soil, you salt poison your soil. So having those close bioregional uh, networks is, um, is really affirming and really powerful and um, you actually have some serious legitimacy when you have that data coming from the ground and then finding those people um, within uh, institutions that you can uh, get more leverage with. So like just down the street we have the CSU Organic Agricultural Research Station and I can work with uh, the man who's running that he is helping me to set up studies on our own on our own property. He's the one who's been great at asking me questions like, how are you gonna measure for that? Oh, well, here's how we measure for that. I'll show you the tools that we use and you can borrow these tools if you need to. Um, or this tool is only this much money and you can go in on it with the guy above you because he needs one too. So finding those ways of just, again, uh, beating a dead horse, but that community engagement and also just taking responsibility for that information for ourselves, uh, empowering ourselves and our customers and our community that way. So just kind of got me uh, thinking that way. Folks, we've clearly passed the official end time. So thanks for hanging tight, everybody. And I will stay on a little longer in case anybody does want to keep going, but also feel free to jump if you need to. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, you, thanks everybody. everyone. Really appreciate uh, you guys inviting me and great to hear all the panelists talk. Uh, it was very enjoyable.